Chapter 30, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Stuckey. Chapter 30, Revolt of the Goths, Part 1. Revolt of the Goths. They plunder Greece. Two great invasions of Italy by Alaric and Radagasius. They are repulsed by Stilicho. The Germans overrun Gaul. Usurpation of Constantine in the West. Disgrace and death of Stilicho. If the subjects of Rome could be ignorant of their obligations to the great Theodosius, they were too soon convinced how painfully the spirit and abilities of their deceased emperor had supported the frail and moldering edifice of the republic. He died in the month of January, and before the end of the winter of the same year, the Gothic nation was in arms. The barbarian auxiliaries erected their independent standard, and boldly avowed the hostile designs which they had long cherished in their ferocious minds. Their countrymen, who had been condemned by the conditions of the last treaty to a life of tranquillity and labor, deserted their farms at the first sound of the trumpet, and eagerly resumed the weapons which they had reluctantly laid down. The barriers of the Danube were thrown open, the savage warriors of Scythia issued from their forest, and the uncommon severity of the winter allowed the poet to remark, that they rolled their ponderous wagons over the broad and icy back of the indignant river. The unhappy natives of the provinces to the south of the Danube submitted to the calamities, which, in the course of twenty years, were almost grown familiar to their imagination, and the various troops of barbarians who gloried in the Gothic name were irregularly spread from woody shore of Dalmatia to the walls of Constantinople. The interruption, or at least the diminution of the subsidy, which the Gauls had received from the prudent liberality of Theodosius, was the spacious pretense of their revolt. The affront was embittered by their contempt for the unwarlike sons of Theodosius, and their resentment was inflamed by the weakness or treachery of the minister of Arcadius, the frequent visits of Rufinus to the camp of the barbarians, whose arms and apparel he affected to imitate, were considered as sufficient evidence of his guilty correspondence, and the public enemy, from a motive either of gratitude or of policy, was attentive, amidst the general devastation, to spare the private estates of the unpopular prefect. The Goths, instead of being impelled by the blind and headstrong passions of their chiefs, were now directed by the bold and artful genius of Alaric. That renowned leader was descended from the noble race of the Baltai, which yielded only to the royal dignity of the Amali. He had solicited the command of the Roman armies, and the imperial court provoked him to demonstrate the folly of their refusal and the importance of their loss. Whatever hopes might be entertained of the conquest of Constantinople, the judicious general soon abandoned an impractical enterprise. In the midst of a divided court and a discontented people, the emperor Arcadius was terrified by the aspect of the Gothic arms, but the want of wisdom and valor was supplied by the strength of the city, and the fortifications, both of sea and land, might securely brave the impotent and random darts of the barbarians. Alaric disdained to trample any longer on the prostate and ruined countries of Thrace and Dacia, and he resolved to seek a plentiful harvest of fame and riches in a province which had hitherto escaped the ravages of war. The character of the civil and military officers, on whom Rufinus had devolved the government of Greece, confirmed the public suspicion that he had betrayed the ancient seat of freedom and learning to the Gothic invader. The proconsul Antiochus was the unworthy son of a respectable father, and Geronitius, who had commanded the provincial troops, was much better qualified to execute the oppressive orders of a tyrant than to defend with courage and ability a country most remarkably fortified by the hand of nature. Alaric had traversed, without resistance, the plains of Macedonia and Thessaly, as far as the foot of Mount Ida, a steep and woody range of hills almost impervious to his cavalry. They stretched from east to west, to the edge of the seashore, and left between the precipice and the Malayan Gulf. An interval of three hundred feet, which in some places was contracted to a road capable of admitting only a single carriage. 
in this narrow pass of Thermopylae, where Leonidas and his three hundred Spartans had gloriously devoted their lives, the Goths might have been stopped, or destroyed, by a skillful general, and perhaps the view of that sacred spot might have kindled some spark of military ardor in the breast of the degenerate Greeks. The troops which had been posted to defend the Straits of Thermopylae retired, as they had been directed, without attempting to disturb the secure and rapid passage of Alaric, and the fertile fields of Potius and Bodia were instantly covered by a deluge of barbarians who massacred the males of an age to bear arms and drove away the beautiful females with the spoil and cattle of the flaming villages. The travelers who visited Greece several years afterwards could easily discover the deep and bloody traces of the march of the Goths, and Thebes was less indebted for her preservation to the strength of her seven gates than to the eager haste of Alaric who advanced to occupy the city of Athens and the important harbor of Piraeus. The same impatience urged him to prevent the delay and danger of a siege by the offer of a capitulation and as soon as the Athenians heard the voice of the Gothic herald, they were easily persuaded to deliver the greatest part of their wealth as the ransom of the city of Minerva and its inhabitants. The treaty was ratified by solemn oaths and observed with mutual fidelity. The Gothic prince, with a small and select train, was admitted within the walls. He indulged himself in the refreshment of the bath, accepted a splendid banquet, which was provided by the magistrate, and affected to show that he was not ignorant of the manners of civilized nations, but the whole territory of Attica, from the promontory of Sunium to the town of Megara, was blasted by his baleful presence. And, if we may use the comparison of a contemporary philosopher, Athens itself resembled the bleeding and empty skin of a slaughtered victim. The distance between Megara and Corinth could not much exceed thirty miles, but the bad road, an expressive name which it still bears among the Greeks, was, or might easily have been made, impassable for the march of an enemy. The thick and gloomy woods of Mount Cetheron covered the inland country, and the Scironian rocks approached the water's edge, and hung over the narrow and winding path which was confined above six miles along the seashore. The passage of these rocks, so infamous in every age, was terminated by the Isthmus of Corinth, and a small body of firm and intrepid soldiers might have successfully defended a temporary entrenchment of five or six miles from the Ionian to the Aegean Sea. The confidence of the cities of the Peloponnesus in their natural rampart had tempted them to neglect the care of their antique walls, and the avarice of the Roman governors had exhausted and betrayed the unhappy province. Corinth, Argos, Sparta yielded almost without resistance to the arms of the Goths, and the most fortunate of the inhabitants were saved by death from beholding the slavery of their family and the conflagration of their cities. The vases and statues were distributed among the barbarians with more regard to the value of the materials than to the elegance of the workmanship. The female captives submitted to the laws of war, and the enjoyment of beauty was the reward of valor, and the Greeks could not reasonably complain of an abuse which was justified by the example of the heroic times. The descendants of that extraordinary people who had considered valor and discipline as the walls of Sparta, no longer remembered the generous reply of their ancestors to the invader more formidable than Alaric. If thou art a god, thou wilt not hurt those who have never injured thee. If thou art a man, advance, and thou wilt find men equal to thyself. From Thermopylae to Sparta, the leader of the Goths pursued his victorious march without encountering any mortal antagonist. But one of the advocates of the expiring paganism has confidently asserted that the walls of Athens were guarded by the goddess Minerva, with her formidable Aegis, and by the angry phantom of Achilles, and that the conqueror was dismayed by the presence of the hostile deities of Greece, in an age of miracles, it would perhaps be unjust to dispute the claim of the historian Zosimus to the common benefit, yet it cannot be dissembled 
that the mind of Alaric was ill-prepared to receive, either in sleeping or waking visions, the impression of Greek superstition. The songs of Homer and the fame of Achilles had probably never reached the ear of the illiterate barbarian, and the Christian faith, which he had devoutly embraced, taught him to despise the imaginary deities of Rome and Athens. The invasion of the Goths, instead of vindicating the honor, contributed, at least accidentally, to extirpate the last remains of paganism. And the mysteries of Ceres, which had subsisted eighteen hundred years, did not survive the destruction of Eleusis and the calamities of Greece. The last hope of a people who could no longer depend on their arms, their gods, or their sovereign was placed in the powerful assistance of the general of the West, and Stilicho, who had not been permitted to repulse, advanced to chastise the invaders of Greece. A numerous fleet was equipped in the ports of Italy, and the troops, after a short and prosperous navigation over the Ionian Sea, were safely disembarked on the isthmus near the ruins of Corinth. The woody and mountainous country of Arcadia, the fabulous residence of Pan and the Dryads, became the scene of a long and doubtful conflict between the two generals not unworthy of each other. The skill and perseverance of the Roman at length prevailed, and the Goths, after sustaining a considerable loss from disease and desertion, gradually retreated to the lofty mountain of Folo, near the sources of the Peneus, and on the frontiers of Elis, a sacred country, which had formerly been exempt from the calamities of war. The camp of the barbarians was immediately besieged. The waters of the river were diverted into another channel, and while they labored under the intolerable pressure of thirst and hunger, a strong line of circumvallation was formed to prevent their escape. After these precautions, Stilicho, too confident of victory, retired to enjoy his triumph in the theatrical games and lavicious dances of the Greeks. His soldiers, deserting their standards, spread themselves over the country of their allies, which they stripped of all that had been saved from the rapacious hands of the enemy. Alaric appears to have seized the favorable moment to execute one of those hardy enterprises in which the abilities of a general are displayed with more genuine luster than in the tumult of a day of battle. To extricate himself from the prison of the Peloponnesus, it was necessary that he should pierce the entrenchments which surrounded his camp, that he should perform a difficult and dangerous march of thirty miles as far as the Gulf of Corinth, and that he should transport his troops, his captives, and his spoil over the arm of the sea, which in the narrow interval between Rhyum and the opposite shore is at least half a mile in breadth. The operations of Alaric must have been secret, prudent, and rapid, since the Roman general was confounded by the intelligence that the Goths, who had eluded his efforts, were in full possession of the important province of Epirus. This unfortunate delay allowed Alaric sufficient time to conclude the treaty which he secretly negotiated with the ministers of Constantinople. The apprehension of a civil war compelled Stilicho to retire at the haughty mandate of his rivals from the dominions of Arcadius, and he respected, in the enemy of Rome, the honorable character of the ally and servant of the emperor of the East. A Grecian philosopher who visited Constantinople soon after the death of Theodosius published his liberal opinions concerning the duties of kings and the state of the Roman Republic. Synesius observes and deplores the fatal abuse which the imprudent bounty of the late emperors had introduced into the military service. The citizens and subjects had purchased an exemption from the indispensable duty of defending their country, which was supported by the arms of barbarian mercenaries. The fugitives of Scythia were permitted to disgrace the illustrious dignities of the empire. Their ferocious youth, who disdained the salutary restraint of laws, were more anxious to acquire the riches than to imitate the arts of a people the object of their contempt and hatred. And the power of the Goths was the stone of Tantalus, and perpetually suspended over the peace and safety of the devoted state. The measures which Synesis recommends are the dictates of a bold and generous patriot. He exhorts the emperor to revive the courage of his subjects by the example of manly virtue, to banish luxury from the court and from the camp, to substitute in the place of the barbarian mercenaries an army of men interested in the defense of their laws and of their property, 
to force in such a moment of public danger the mechanic from his shop and the philosopher from his school to rouse the indolent citizen from his dream of pleasure and to arm for the protection of agriculture the hands of the laborious husbandmen at the head of such troops who might deserve the name and who would display the spirit of romans he animates the son of theodosius to encounter a race of barbarians who were destitute of any real courage and never to lay down his arms till he had chased them far away into the solitudes of scythia or had reduced them to the state of ignominious servitude which the lacedaemonians formerly imposed on the captive helots the court of arcadius indulged the zeal applauded the eloquence and neglected the advice of synesius perhaps the philosopher who addresses the emperor of the east in the language of reason and virtue which he might have used to a spartan king had not condescended to form a practicable scheme consistent with the temper and circumstances of a degenerate age perhaps the pride of the ministers whose business was seldom interrupted by reflection might reject as wild and visionary every proposal which exceeded the measure of their capacity and deviated from the forms and precedents of office while the oration of Synesis and the downfall of barbarians were the topics of popular conversation, an edict was published at Constantinople, which declared the promotion of Alaric to the rank of Master General of the Eastern Illyricum. The Roman provincials and the allies, who had respected the faith of treaties, were justly indignant that the ruin of Greece and Epirus should be so liberally rewarded. The Gothic conqueror was received as a lawful magistrate in the cities which he had so lately besieged. The fathers, whose sons he had massacred, the husbands, whose wives he had violated, were subject to his authority, and the success of his rebellion encouraged the ambition of every leader of the foreign mercenaries. The use to which Alaric applied his new command distinguishes the firm and judicious character of his policy. He issued his orders to the four magazines and manufacturers of offensive and defensive arms, Margus, Retiaria, Nasus, and Thessalonica, to provide his troops with an extraordinary supply of shields, helmets, swords, and spears. The unhappy provincials were compelled to forge the instruments of their own destruction, and the barbarians removed the only defect which had sometimes disappointed the efforts of their courage. The birth of Alaric, the glory of his past exploits, and the confidence in his future designs insensibly united the body of the nation under his victorious standard and with the unanimous consent of the barbarian chieftains the master-general of illyricum was elevated according to the ancient custom on a shield and solemnly proclaimed king of the visigoths armed with this double power seated on the verge of the two empires he alternately sold his deceitful promises to the court of arcadius and honorius till he declared and executed his resolution of invading the dominions of the west the provinces of europe which belonged to the eastern emperor were already exhausted those of asia were inaccessible and the strength of constantinople had resisted his attack but he was tempted by the fame the beauty the wealth of italy which he had twice visited and he secretly aspired to plant the gothic standard on the walls of rome and to enrich his army with the accumulated spoils of three hundred triumphs the scarcity of facts and the uncertainty of dates oppose our attempts to describe the circumstances of the first invasion of italy by the arms of alaric his march perhaps from thessalonica through the warlike and hostile country of pannonia as far as the foot of the julian alps his passage of those mountains which were strongly guarded by troops and entrenchments the siege of aquilia and the conquest of the provinces of istria and venetia appear to have employed a considerable time unless his operations were extremely cautious and slow the length of the interval would suggest a probable suspicion that the gothic king retreated toward the banks of the danube and reinforced his army with fresh swarms of barbarians before he again attempted to penetrate into the heart of italy since the public and important events escape the diligence of the historian he may amuse himself with contemplating 
for a moment, the influence of the arms of Alaric on the fortunes of two obscure individuals, a presbyter of Aquileia and a husbandman of Verona. The learned Rufinus, who was summoned by his enemies to appear before a Roman synod, wisely preferred the dangers of a besieged city. And the barbarians who furiously shook the walls of Aquileia might save him from the cruel sentence of another heretic, who, at the request of the same bishops, was severely whipped and condemned to perpetual exile on a desert island. The old man, who had passed his simple and innocent life in the neighborhood of Verona, was a stranger to the quarrels of both kings and of bishops. His pleasures, his desires, his knowledge, were confined within the little circle of his paternal farm, and a staff supported by his aged steps on the same ground where he had sported in his infancy. Yet even this humble and rustic felicity, which the Claudian describes with so much truth and feeling, was still exposed to the undistinguishing rage of war. His trees, his old contemporary trees, must blaze in the conflagration of the whole country. A detachment of Gothic cavalry might sweep away his cottage and his family, and the power of Alaric could destroy this happiness, which he was not able to either taste or to bestow. Fame, says the poet, encircling with terror her gloomy wings, proclaimed the march of the barbarian army and filled Italy with consternation. The apprehensions of each individual were increased in just proportion to the measure of his fortune, and the most timid who had already embarked their valuable effects meditated their escape to the island of Sicily or the African coast. The public distress was aggravated by the fears and reproaches of superstition. Every hour produced some horrid tale of strange and portentous accidents. The pagans deplored the neglect of omens and the interruption of sacrifices, but the Christians still derived some comfort from the powerful intercession of the saints and the martyrs. End Chapter 30 Part 1 Recording by Jeff Stuckey of Atlanta, Georgia Further information concerning Jeff Stuckey can be found by visiting jeffstuckey.com Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Stuckey. Chapter 30. Revolt of the Goths, Part 2. The Emperor Honorius was distinguished above his subjects by the preeminence of fear as well as of rank. The pride and luxury in which he was educated had not allowed him to suspect that there existed on earth any power presumptuous enough to invade the repose of the successor of Augustus. The arts of flattery concealed the impending danger till Alaric approached the palace of Milan. But when the sound of war had awakened the young emperor, instead of flying to arms with the spirit or even the rashness of his age, he eagerly listened to those timid counselors who proposed to convey his sacred person and his faithful attendants to some secure and distant station in the provinces of Gaul. Stilicho alone had courage and authority to resist his disgraceful measure, which would have abandoned Rome and Italy to the barbarians. But as the troops of the palace had been lately detached to the Raetian frontier, and as the resource of the new levy was slow and precarious, the general of the West could only promise that if the court of Milan would maintain their ground during his absence, he would soon return with an army equal to the encounter of the Gothic king. Without losing a moment, while each moment was so important to the public safety, Stilicho hastily embarked on the Larian Lake, ascended the mountains of ice and snow amidst the severity of an alpine winter, and suddenly repressed, by his unexpected presence, the enemy, who had disturbed the tranquility of Raetia. The barbarians, perhaps some tribes of the Alemanni, respected the firmness of a chief who still assumed the language of command, and the choice which he condescended to make of a select number of their bravest youth was considered as a mark of his esteem and favor. The cohorts, who were delivered from the neighboring foe, diligently repaired to the imperial standard, and Stilicho issued his orders to the most remote troops of the West, to advance, 
by rapid marches to the defense of Honorius and of Italy. The fortresses of the Rhine were abandoned, and the safety of Gaul was protected only by the faith of the Germans and the ancient terror of the Roman name. Even the legion which had been stationed to guard the walls of Britain against the Caledonians of the north was hastily recalled, and a numerous body of the cavalry of the Alani was persuaded to engage in the service of the emperor, who anxiously expected the return of his general. The prudence and vigor of Stilicho were conspicuous on this occasion, which revealed at the same time the weakness of the falling empire. The legions of Rome, which had long since languished in the gradual decay of discipline and courage, were exterminated by the Gothic and civil wars, and it was found impossible without exhausting and exposing the provinces to assemble an army for the defense of Italy. End of chapter 30, part 2. Recording by Jeff Stuckey of Atlanta, Georgia. Further information concerning Jeff Stuckey can be found by visiting jeffstuckey.com. Chapter 30, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Stuckey. Chapter 30, Revolt of the Goths, Part 3. When Stilicho seemed to abandon his sovereign in the unguarded palace of Milan, he had probably calculated the term of his absence, the distance of the enemy, and the obstacles that might retard their march. He principally depended on the rivers of Italy, the Adige, the Menesius, the Oglio, and the Adua, which, in the winter or spring, by the fall of rains or by the melting of the snows, are commonly swelled into broad and impetuous torrents. But the season happened to be remarkably dry, and the Goths could traverse without impediment the wide and stony beds, whose center was faintly marked by the course of a shallow stream. The bridge and passage of the Attawa were secured by a strong detachment of Gothic army, and as Alaric approached the walls, or rather the suburbs of Milan, he enjoyed the proud satisfaction of seeing the emperor of the Romans fly before him. Honorius, accompanied by a feeble train of statesmen and eunuchs, hastily retreated toward the Alps, with the design of securing his person in the city of Arlai, which had often been the royal residence of his predecessors. But Honorius had scarcely passed the Po before he was overtaken by the speed of the Gothic cavalry. Since the urgency of the danger compelled him to seek a temporary shelter within the fortifications of Asta, a town of Liguria or Piemont, situated on the banks of the Tenaris, the siege of an obscure place, which contained so rich a prize, and seemed incapable of long resistance, was instantly formed, and indefatigably pressed, by the king of the Goths and the bold declaration which the emperor might afterwards make that his breast had never been susceptible of fear did not probably obtain much credit even in his own court in the last and almost hopeless extremity after the barbarians had already proposed the indignity of a capitulation the imperial captive was suddenly relieved by the fame the approach and at length the presence of the hero whom he had so long expected at the head of a chosen and intrepid vanguard, Stilicho swam the stream of the Adua to gain the time which he must have lost in the attack of the bridge. The passage of the Po was an enterprise of much less hazard and difficulty, and the successful action in which he cut his way through the Gothic camps under the walls of Asta revived the hopes and vindicated the honor of Rome. Instead of grasping the fruits of his victory, the barbarian was gradually invested on every side by the troops of the West, who successively issued through all the passes of the Alps. His quarters were straightened, his convoys were intercepted, and the vigilance of the Romans prepared to form a chain of fortifications and to besiege the lines of the besiegers. A military council was assembled of the long-haired chiefs of the Gothic nation, of aged warriors whose bodies were wrapped in furs and whose stern countenances were marked with honorable wounds. They weighed the glory of persisting in their attempt against the advantage of securing their plunder and they recommended the prudent measure of a seasonable retreat. In this important debate, Alaric displayed the spirit of the conqueror of Rome, and after he had reminded his countrymen of their achievements and of their designs, he concluded his animating speech by the solemn and positive assurance that he was resolved to find in Italy either a kingdom or a grave. 
The loose discipline of the barbarians always exposed them to the danger of a surprise, but instead of choosing the desolate hours of riot and intemperance, Stilicho resolved to attack the Christian Goths whilst they were devoutly employed in celebrating the festival of Easter. The execution of the stratagem, or as it was termed by the clergy of the sacrilege, was entrusted to Saul, a barbarian and a pagan, who had served, however, with distinguished reputation among the veteran generals of Theodosius. The camp of the Goths, which Alaric had pitched in the neighborhood of Palentia, was thrown into confusion by the sudden and impetuous charge of the imperial cavalry, but in a few moments the undaunted genius of their leader gave them an order and a field of battle and as soon as they had recovered from their astonishment the pious confidence that the god of the christians would assert their cause added new strength to their native valor in this engagement which was long maintained with equal courage and success the chief of the alani whose diminutive and savage form concealed a magnanimous soul approved his suspected loyalty by the zeal with which he fought and fell in the service of the republic and the fame of this gallant barbarian has been imperfectly preserved in the verses of Claudian, since the poet who celebrates his virtue has omitted the mention of his name. His death was followed by the flight and dismay of the squadrons which he commanded, and the defeat of the wing of cavalry might have declared the victory of Alaric, if Stilicho had not immediately led the Roman and barbarian infantry to the attack. The skill of the general and the bravery of the soldiers surmounted every obstacle." In the evening of the bloody day, the Goths retreated from the field of battle. The entrenchments of their camps were forced, and the scene of the rapine and slaughter made some atonement for the calamities which they had inflicted on the subjects of the empire. The magnificent spoils of Corinth and Argos enriched the veterans of the West. The captive wife of Alaric, who had impatiently claimed his promise of Roman jewels and patrician handmaids, was reduced to implore the mercy of the insulting foe and many thousand prisoners released from the gothic chains dispersed through the provinces of italy the praises of their heroic deliverer the triumph of stilicho was compared by the poet and perhaps by the public to that of marius who in the same part of italy had encountered and destroyed another army of northern barbarians the huge bones and the empty helmets of the cambri of the goths would easily be confounded by succeeding generations and posterity might erect a common trophy to the memory of the two most illustrious generals who had vanquished on the same memorial ground the two most formidable enemies of rome the eloquence of claudian had celebrated with lavish applause the victory of palentia one of the most glorious days in the life of his patron but his reluctant and partial muse bestows more genuine praise on the character of the Gothic king. His name is, indeed, branded with the reproachable epithets of pirate and robber, to which the conquerors of every age are so justly entitled. But the poet of Stilicho is compelled to acknowledge that Alaric possessed the invincible temper of mind, which rises superior to every misfortune, and derives new resource from adversary. After the total defeat of his infantry, he escaped, or rather withdrew from the field of battle, with the greatest part of his cavalry entire and unbroken. Without wasting a moment to lament the irreparable loss of so many brave companions, he left his victorious enemy to bind and change the captive images of a Gothic king, and boldly resolved to break through the unguarded passes of the Apennine, to spread desolation over the fruitful face of Tuscany, and to conquer or die before the gates of Rome. The capital was saved by the active and incessant diligence of Stilicho, but he respected the despair of his enemy, and instead of committing the fate of the Republic to the chance of another battle, he proposed to purchase the absence of the barbarians. The spirit of Alaric would have rejected such terms, the permission of a retreat and the offer of a pension, with contempt and indignation but he exercised a limited and precarious authority over the independent chieftains who had raised him for their service above the ranks of his equals they were still less disposed to follow an unsuccessful general and many of them were tempted to consult their interests by a private negotiation with the ministers of honorius the king submitted to the voice of his people ratified the treaty with the empire of the west and repassed the po with the remains of the flourishing army which he had led into italy a considerable part of the Roman forces still continued to attend his motions, and Stilicho, who maintained a secret correspondence with some of the barbarian chiefs, was punctually appraised of the designs that were formed in the camps and councils of Alaric. The king of the Goths, ambitious to signalize his retreat by some splendid achievement, had resolved to occupy the important city of Verona, which commands the principal passages of the Raetian Alps, and, 
directing his march through the territories of those German tribes whose allegiance would restore his exhausted strength to invade on the side of the Rhine, the wealthy and unsuspecting provinces of Gaul. Ignorant of the treason which had already betrayed his bold and judicious enterprise, he advanced toward the passes of the mountains already possessed by the imperial troops, where he was exposed, almost at the same instant, to a general attack in the front, on his flanks, and in the rear. In this bloody action, at a small distance from the walls of Verona, the loss of the Goths was not less heavy than that which they had sustained in the defeat of Palentia, and their valiant king, who escaped by the swiftness of his horse, must either have been slain or made prisoner, if the hasty rashness of the Alani had not disappointed the measures of the Roman general. Alaric secured the remains of his army on the adjacent rocks, and prepared himself with undaunted resolution to maintain a siege against the superior numbers of the enemy, who invested him on all sides. But he could not oppose the destructive progress of hunger and disease, nor was it possible for him to check the continual desertion of his impatient and capricious barbarians. In this extremity he still found resources in his own courage, or in the moderation of his adversary and the retreat to the Gothic king was considered as the deliverance of Italy. Yet the people, and even the clergy, incapable of forming any rational judgment of the business of peace and war, presumed to arrange the policy of Stilicho, who so often vanquished, so often surrounded, and so often dismissed the implacable enemy of the Republic. The first moment of the public safety is devoted to gratitude and joy, but the second is diligently occupied by envy and calumny. The citizens of Rome had been astonished by the approach of Alaric, and the diligence with which they had labored to restore the walls of the capital confessed their own fears and the decline of the empire. After the retreat of the barbarians, Honorius was directed to accept the dutiful invitation of the Senate and to celebrate in the imperial city the auspicious era of the Gothic victory and his sixth consulship. The suburbs and the streets from which the Milvian Bridge and the Palatine Mount were filled by the Roman people, who in the space of a hundred years had only thrice honored with the presence of their sovereigns, while their eyes were fixed on the chariot where Stilicho was deservedly seated by the side of his royal pupil. They applauded the pomp of the triumph, which was not stained like that of Constantine or of Theodosius with civil blood. The procession passed under the lofty arch which had been purposely erected but in less than seven years the Gothic conquerors of Rome might read, if they were able to read, the superb inscription of that monument, which attested the total defeat and destruction of their nation. The emperor resided several months in the capital, and every part of his behavior was regulated with care to conciliate the affection of the clergy, the senate, and the people of Rome. The clergy was edified by his frequent visits and liberal gifts to the shrines of the apostles, the senate, who, in the triumphal procession, had been excused from the humiliating ceremony of proceeding on foot the imperial chariot, was treated with the decent reverence which Stilicho always affected for that assembly. The people was regularly gratified by the attention and the courtesy of Honorius in the public games, which were celebrated on that occasion with the magnificence not unworthy of the spectator. As soon as the appointed number of chariot races was concluded and the decoration of the circus was suddenly changed, the hunting of wild beasts afforded a various and splendid entertainment, and the chase was succeeded by a military dance, which seems, in the lively description of Claudian, to represent the image of a modern tournament. In these games of Honorius, the inhuman combats of gladiators polluted, for the last time, the amphitheater of Rome. The first Christian emperor made claim the honor of the first edict which condemned the art and amusement of shedding human blood. But this benevolent law expressed the wishes of the prince, without reforming an inveterate abuse which degraded a civilized nation below the condition of savage cannibals. Several hundred, perhaps several thousand victims were annually slaughtered in the great cities of the empire, and the month of December, more peculiarly devoted to the combats of gladiators, still exhibited to the eyes of the Roman people a grateful spectacle of blood and cruelty. Amidst the general joy of the victory of Palentia, a Christian poet exhorted the emperor to extirpate by his authority the horrid custom which had so long resisted the voice of humanity and religion. The pathetic representations of Prudentius were less effectual than the generous boldness of Telemachus, an ascetic monk whose death was more useful to mankind than his life. The Romans were provoked by the interruption of their pleasures, and the rash monk who had descended into the arena to separate the gladiators was overwhelmed under a shower of stones. But the madness of the people soon subsided, and they respected the memory of Telemachus, who had deserved the honors of martyrdom, and they submitted, without a murmur, to the laws of Honorius, which abolished forever the human sacrifices of the amphitheater. 
The citizens who adhered to the manners of their ancestors might perhaps insinuate that the last remains of a martial spirit were preserved in this school of fortitude, which accustomed the Romans to the sight of blood and to the contempt of death. A vain and cruel prejudice, so nobly confuted by the valor of ancient Greece and of modern Europe. The recent danger to which the person of the emperor had been exposed in the defenseless palace of Milan urged him to seek a retreat in some inaccessible fortress of Italy, where he might securely remain while the open country was covered by the deluge of barbarians. On the coast of the Adriatic, about ten or twelve miles from the most southern of the seven mouths of the Po, the Thessalians had founded the ancient colony of Ravenna, which they had afterwards resigned to the natives of Umbria. Augustus, who had observed the opportunity of the place, prepared at the distance of three miles from the old town a capacious harbor for the reception of 250 ships of war. This naval establishment, which included the arsenals and magazines, the barracks of the troops, and the houses of the artificers, derived its origin and name from the permanent station of the Roman fleet. The intermediate space was soon filled with buildings and inhabitants, and the three extensive and populous quarters of Ravenna gradually contributed to form one of the most important cities of Italy. The principal canal of Augustus poured a copious stream of the waters of the Po through the midst of the city, in the entrance of the harbor, the same waters were introduced into the profound ditches that encompassed the walls. They were distributed by a thousand subordinate canals into every part of the city, which they divided into a variety of small islands. The communication was maintained only by the use of boats and bridges, and the houses of Ravenna, whose appearance may be compared to that of Venice, were raised on a foundation of wooden piles. The adjacent country, to the distance of many miles, was a deep and impassable morass and the artificial causeway, which connected Ravenna with the continent, might be easily guarded or destroyed on the approach of a hostile army. These morasses were interspersed, however, with vineyards, and though the soil was exhausted by four or five crops, the town enjoyed a more plentiful supply of wine than of fresh water. The air, instead of receiving the sickly and almost pestilential exaltations of low and marshy grounds, was distinguished like the neighborhood of Alexandria is uncommonly pure and salubrious, and this singular advantage was ascribed to the regular tides of the Adriatic, which swept the canals, interrupted the unwholesome stagnation of the waters, and floated every day the vessels of the adjacent country into the heart of Ravenna. The gradual retreat of the sea has left the modern city at the distance of four miles from the Adriatic, and as early as the fifth or sixth century of the Christian era, the port of Augustus was converted into the pleasant orchards and the lonely grove of pines covered the ground where the Roman fleet once rode at anchor. Even this alteration contributed to increase the natural strength of the place, and the shallowness of the water was a sufficient barrier against the large ships of the enemy. This advantageous situation was fortified by art and labor in the twelfth year of his age. The emperor of the West, anxious only for his personal safety, retired to the perpetual confinement of the walls and morasses of Ravenna. The example of Honorius was imitated by his feeble successors. The Gothic kings and afterwards the exarchs, who occupied the throne and palace of the emperor, until the middle of the eighth century, Ravenna was considered as the seat of government and the capital of Italy. The fears of Honorius were not without foundation, nor were his precautions without effect. While Italy rejoiced in her deliverance from the Goths, a furious tempest was excited among the nations of Germany, who yielded to the irresistible impulse that appears to have been gradually communicated from the eastern extremity of the continent of Asia. The Chinese annals, as they have been interpreted by the earned industry of the present age, may be usefully applied to reveal the secret and remote causes of the fall of the Roman Empire. The extensive territory to the north of the Great Wall was possessed after the flight of the Huns by the victorious Senpai, who were sometimes broken into independent tribes, and sometimes reunited under a supreme chief, till, at length, styling themselves the Topa, or masters of the earth, they acquired a more solid consistence and a more formidable power. The Topa soon compelled the pastoral nations of the eastern desert to acknowledge the superiority of their arm. They invaded China in a period of weakness and intestine discord, and these fortunate Tartars, adopting the laws and manners of the vanquished people, founded an imperial dynasty which reigned nearly 160 years over the northern provinces of the monarchy. Some generations before they ascended the throne of China, one of the Topa princes had enlisted his cavalry, a slave of the name of Moko, renowned for his valor, but who was tempted by the fear of punishment to desert his standard and range the desert at the head of a hundred followers. This gang of robbers and outlaws swelled into a camp, 
a tribe, a numerous people, distinguished by the appellation of Jedin and their hereditary chieftains. The posterity of Moko the slave assumed the rank among the Scythian monarchs. The youth of Tulan, the greatest of his descendants, was exercised by those misfortunes which are the school of heroes. He bravely struggled with adversity, broke the imperious yoke of the Topa, and became the legislator of his nation and the conqueror of Tartary. His troops were distributed into regular bands of a hundred and of a thousand men. Cowards were stoned to death. The most splendid honors were proposed as a reward for valor, and Toulon, who had knowledge enough to despise the learning of China, adopted only such arts and institutions as were favorable to the military spirit of his government. His tents, which he removed in the winter season to a more southern latitude, were pitched during the summer on the fruitful banks of the Selinga. His conquest stretched from Korea, far beyond the river Irtish. He vanquished in the country to the north of the Caspian Sea, the nation of the Huns. And the new title of Khan, or Kagan, expressed the fame and power which he derived from this memorable victory. The chain of events is interrupted, or rather is concealed, as it passes from the Volga to the Vistula, through the dark interval which separates the extreme limits of the Chinese and of the Roman geography. Yet the temper of the barbarians and the experience of successive immigrations sufficiently declared that the Huns, who were oppressed by the arms of Jiaden, soon withdrew from the presence of an insulting victor. The countries toward the Exine were already occupied by their kindred tribes, and their hasty flight which they soon converted into a bold attack, would more naturally be directed toward the rich and level plains, through which the Vistula gently flows into the Baltic Sea. The North must again have been alarmed and agitated by the invasion of the Huns, and the nations who retreated before them must have pressed with incumbent weight on the confines of Germany. The inhabitants of those regions, which the ancients have assigned to the Suvi and the Vandals and the Burgundians might have embraced the resolution of abandoning the fugitives of Sarmatia, their woods, and their morasses, or at least of discharging their superfluous numbers on the provinces of the Roman Empire. About four years after the victorious Talon had assumed the title of Khan and of Giadin, another barbarian, the haughty Rodegast or Ragastus, marched from the northern extremities of Germany almost to the gates of Rome, and left the remains of his army to achieve the destruction of the West. The Vandals, the Suvi, and the Burgundians formed the strength of this mighty host, but the Alani, who had found a hospitable reception in their new seats, added their active cavalry to the heavy infantry of the Germans, and the Gothic adventurers crowded so eagerly to the standard of Radagatius that by some historians he has been styled the king of the Goths. Twelve thousand warriors, distinguished above the vulgar by their noble birth, or by their valiant deeds, glittered in the van, and the whole multitude, which was not less than 200,000 fighting men, might be increased by the accession of women and children and of slaves to the amount of 400,000 persons. This formidable immigration issued from the same coast of the Baltic, which had poured forth the myriads of the Cimbri and the Teutons, to assault Rome and Italy in the vigor of the Republic. After the departure of those barbarians, their native country, which was marked by the vestiges of their greatness, long ramparts and gigantic moles, remained some ages of vast and dreary solitude, till the human species was renewed by the powers of generation, and the vacancy was filled by the influx of new inhabitants. The nations who now usurp an extent of land which they are unable to cultivate, would soon be assisted by the industrious poverty of their neighbors if the government of Europe did not protect the claims of dominion and property. End of chapter 30, part 3. Recording by Jeff Stuckey of Atlanta, Georgia. Further information concerning Jeff Stuckey can be found by visiting jeffstuckey.com. Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 30 Revolt of the Goths. Part Four. The correspondence of nations was, in that age, so imperfect and precarious that the revolutions of the North 
might escape the knowledge of the court of Ravenna, till the dark cloud, which was collected along the coast of the Baltic, burst in thunder upon the banks of the upper Danube. The Emperor of the West, if his ministers disturbed his amusements by the news of the impending danger, was satisfied with being the occasion and the spectator of the war. The safety of Rome was entrusted to the councils, and the sword of Stilicho, but such was the feeble and exhausted state of the empire, that it was impossible to restore the fortifications of the Danube, or to prevent, by a vigorous effort, the invasion of the Germans. The hopes of the vigilant minister of Honorius were confined to the defence of Italy. He once more abandoned the provinces, recalled the troops, pressed the new levies, which were rigorously exacted and pusillanimously eluded, employed the most efficacious means to arrest or allure the deserters, and offered the gift of freedom and of two pieces of gold to all the slaves who would enlist. By these efforts he painfully collected, from the subjects of a great empire, an army of thirty or forty thousand men, which, in the days of Scipio or Camillus, would have been instantly furnished by the free citizens of the territory of Rome. The thirty legions of Stilicho were reinforced by a large body of barbarian auxiliaries. The faithful Alani were personally attached to his service, and the troops of Huns and of Goths, who marched under the banners of their native princes, Huldin and Sarus, were animated by interest and resentment to oppose the ambition of Radagaisus. The king of the confederate Germans passed, without resistance, the Alps, the Po, and the Apennine, leaving on one hand the inaccessible palace of Honorius securely buried among the marshes of Ravenna, and on the other the camp of Stilicho, who had fixed his headquarters at Ticinum or Pavia, but who seems to have avoided a decisive battle till he had assembled his distant forces. Many cities of Italy were pillaged or destroyed, and the siege of Florence by Radagaisus is one of the earliest events in the history of that celebrated republic, whose firmness checked and delayed the unskilful fury of the barbarians. The senate and people trembled at their approach within a hundred and eighty miles of Rome, and anxiously compared the danger which they had escaped with the new perils to which they were exposed. Alaric was a Christian and a soldier, the leader of a disciplined army, who understood the laws of war, who respected the sanctity of treaties, and who had familiarly conversed with the subjects of the empire in the same camps and the same churches. The savage Radagaisus was a stranger to the manners, the religion, and even the language of the civilized nations of the South. The fierceness of his temper was exasperated by cruel superstition, and it was universally believed that he had bound himself by a solemn vow to reduce the city into a heap of stones and ashes, and to sacrifice the most illustrious of the Roman senators on the altars of those gods who were appeased by human blood. The public danger, which should have reconciled all domestic animosities, displayed the incurable madness of religious faction. The oppressed votaries of Jupiter and Mercury respected, in the implacable enemy of Rome, the character of a devout pagan, loudly declared that they were more apprehensive of the sacrifices than of the arms of Radagaisus, and secretly rejoiced in the calamities of their country, which condemned the faith of their Christian adversaries. Florence was reduced to the last extremity, and the fainting courage of the citizens was supported only by the authority of St. Ambrose, who had communicated in a dream the promise of a speedy deliverance. On a sudden they beheld from their walls the banners of Stilicho, who advanced with his united force to the relief of the faithful city, and who soon marked that fatal spot for the grave of the barbarian host. The apparent contradictions of those writers, who variously relate the defeat of Radagaisus, may be reconciled without offering much violence to their respective testimonies. 
Orosius and Augustine, who were intimately connected by friendship and religion, ascribed this miraculous victory to the providence of God, rather than to the valour of man. They strictly exclude every idea of chance, or even of bloodshed, and positively affirm that the Romans, whose camp was the scene of plenty and idleness, enjoyed the distress of the barbarians, slowly expiring on the sharp and barren ridge of the hills of Faisulae, which rise above the city of Florence. Their extravagant assertion that not a single soldier of the Christian army was killed, or even wounded, may be dismissed with silent contempt. But the rest of the narrative of Augustine and Orosius is consistent with the state of the war, and the character of Stilicho. Conscious that he commanded the last army of the Republic, his prudence would not expose it, in the open field, to the headstrong fury of the Germans. The method of surrounding the enemy with strong lines of circumvallation, which he had twice employed against the Gothic king, was repeated on a larger scale, and with more considerable effect. The examples of Caesar must have been familiar to the most illiterate of the Roman warriors, and the fortifications of Dyrrhachium, which connected twenty-four castles by a perpetual ditch and rampart of fifteen miles, afforded the model of an entrenchment which might confine and starve the most numerous host of barbarians. The Roman troops had less degenerated from the industry than from the valour of their ancestors, and if their servile and laborious work offended the pride of the soldiers, Tuscany could supply many thousand peasants, who would labour, though perhaps they would not fight, for the salvation of their native country. The imprisoned multitude of horses and men was gradually destroyed by famine rather than by the sword, but the Romans were exposed, during the progress of such an extensive work, to the frequent attacks of an impatient enemy. The despair of the hungry barbarians would precipitate them against the fortifications of Stilicho. The general might sometimes indulge the ardour of his brave auxiliaries, who eagerly pressed to assault the camp of the Germans, and these various incidents might produce the sharp and bloody conflicts which dignify the narrative of Zosimus and the chronicles of Prosper and Marcellinus. A seasonable supply of men and provisions had been introduced into the walls of Florence, and the famished host of Radagaisus was in its turn besieged. The proud monarch of so many warlike nations, after the loss of his bravest warriors, was reduced to confide either in the faith of a capitulation, or in the clemency of Stilicho. But the death of the royal captive, who was ignominiously beheaded, disgraced the triumph of Rome and of Christianity, and the short delay of his execution was sufficient to brand the conqueror with the guilt of cool and deliberate cruelty. The famished Germans, who escaped the fury of the auxiliaries, were sold as slaves, at the contemptible price of as many single pieces of gold. But the difference of food and climate swept away great numbers of those unhappy strangers, and it was observed that the inhuman purchasers, instead of reaping the fruits of their labour, were soon obliged to provide the expense of their interment. Stilicho informed the Emperor and the Senate of his success, and deserved a second time the glorious title of Deliverer of Italy. The fame of the victory, and more especially of the miracle, has encouraged a vain persuasion that the whole army, or rather nation, of Germans, who migrated from the shores of the Baltic, miserably perished under the walls of Florence. Such indeed was the fate of Radagaisus himself, of his brave and faithful companions, and of more than one-third of the various multitude of Sueves and Vandals, of Alani and Burgundians, who adhered to the standard of their general. The union of such an army might excite our surprise, but the causes of separation are obvious and forcible, the pride of birth, the insolence of valour, the jealousy of command, the impatience of subordination, and the obstinate conflict of opinions 
of interests and of passions, among so many kings and warriors, who were untaught to yield or to obey. After the defeat of Radagaisus, two parts of the German host, which must have exceeded the number of one hundred thousand men, still remained in arms between the Apennine and the Alps, or between the Alps and the Danube. It is uncertain whether they attempted to revenge the death of their general, but their irregular fury was soon diverted by the prudence and firmness of Stilicho, who opposed their march and facilitated their retreat, who considered the safety of Rome and Italy as the great object of his care, and who sacrificed with too much indifference the wealth and tranquillity of the distant provinces. The barbarians acquired, from the junction of some Pannonian deserters, the knowledge of the country and of the roads, and the invasion of Gaul, which Alaric had designed, was executed by the remains of the great army of Radagaisus. Yet if they expected to derive any assistance from the tribes of Germany, who inhabited the banks of the Rhine, their hopes were disappointed. The Alemanni preserved a state of inactive neutrality, and the Franks distinguished their zeal and courage in the defence of the empire. In the rapid progress down the Rhine, which was the first act of the administration of Stilicho, he had applied himself with peculiar attention to secure the alliance of the warlike Franks, and to remove the irreconcilable enemies of peace and the Republic. Markamir, one of their kings, was publicly convicted, before the tribunal of the Roman magistrate, of violating the faith of treaties. He was sentenced to a mild but distant exile in the province of Tuscany, and this degradation of the regal dignity was so far from exciting the resentment of his subjects, that they punished with death the turbulent Sunno, who attempted to revenge his brother, and maintained a dutiful allegiance to the princes, who were established on the throne by the choice of Stilicho. When the limits of Gaul and Germany were shaken by the northern emigration, the Franks bravely encountered the single force of the Vandals, who, regardless of the lessons of adversity, had again separated their troops from the standard of their barbarian allies. They paid the penalty of their rashness, and twenty thousand Vandals, with their king Godigisclus, were slain in the field of battle. The whole people must have been extirpated, if the squadrons of the Alani, advancing to their relief, had not trampled down the infantry of the Franks, who, after an honourable resistance, were compelled to relinquish the unequal contest. The victorious confederates pursued their march, and on the last day of the year, in a season when the waters of the Rhine were most probably frozen, they entered, without opposition, the defenceless provinces of Gaul. This memorable passage of the Suevi, the Vandals, the Alani, and the Burgundians, who never afterwards retreated, may be considered as the fall of the Roman Empire in the countries beyond the Alps, and the barriers, which had so long separated the savage and the civilized nations of the earth, were, from that fatal moment, levelled with the ground. While the peace of Germany was secured by the attachment of the Franks, and the neutrality of the Alemanni, the subjects of Rome, unconscious of their approaching calamities, enjoyed the state of quiet and prosperity, which had seldom blessed the frontiers of Gaul. Their flocks and herds were permitted to graze in the pastures of the barbarians, their huntsmen penetrated, without fear or danger, into the darkest recesses of the Hercynian wood. The banks of the Rhine were crowned, like those of the Tiber, with elegant houses and well-cultivated farms, and if a poet descended the river, he might express his doubt on which side was situated the territory of the Romans. The scene of peace and plenty was suddenly changed into a desert, and the prospect of the smoking ruins could alone distinguish the solitude of nature from the desolation of man. The flourishing city of Mentz was surprised and destroyed, and many thousand Christians were inhumanly massacred in the church. 
Worms perished after a long and obstinate siege. Strasbourg, Spires, Reims, Tournay, Arras, Amiens experienced the cruel oppression of the German yoke, and the consuming flames of war spread from the banks of the Rhine over the greatest part of the seventeen provinces of Gaul. That rich and extensive country, as far as the ocean, the Alps, and the Pyrenees, was delivered to the barbarians, who drove before them, in a promiscuous crowd, the bishop, the senator, and the virgin, laden with the spoils of their houses and altars. The ecclesiastics, to whom we are indebted for this vague description of the public calamities, embraced the opportunity of exhorting the Christians to repent of the sins which had provoked the divine justice, and to renounce the perishable goods of a wretched and deceitful world. But as the Pelagian controversy, which attempts to sound the abyss of grace and predestination, soon became the serious employment of the Latin clergy, the providence which had decreed, or foreseen, or permitted, such a train of moral and natural evils, was rashly weighed in the imperfect and fallacious balance of reason. The crimes and the misfortunes of the suffering people were presumptuously compared with those of their ancestors, and they arraigned the divine justice, which did not exempt from the common destruction the feeble, the guiltless, the infant portion of the human species. These idle disputants overlooked the invariable laws of nature, which have connected peace with innocence, plenty with industry, and safety with valour. The timid and selfish policy of the court of Ravenna might recall the Palatine legions for the protection of Italy. The remains of the stationary troops might be unequal to the arduous task, and the barbarian auxiliaries might prefer the unbounded license of spoil to the benefits of a moderate and regular stipend. But the provinces of Gaul were filled with a numerous race of hardy and robust youth, who, in the defence of their houses, their families, and their altars, if they had dared to die, would have deserved to vanquish. The knowledge of their native country would have enabled them to oppose continual and insuperable obstacles to the progress of an invader, and the deficiency of the barbarians, in arms as well as in discipline, removed the only pretense which excuses the submission of a populous country to the inferior numbers of a veteran army. When France was invaded by Charles V, he inquired of a prisoner how many days Paris might be distant from the border. Perhaps twelve, but they will be days of battle. Such was the gallant answer which checked the arrogance of that ambitious priest. The subjects of Honorius, and those of Francis I, were animated by a very different spirit, and in less than two years the divided troops of the savages of the Baltic whose numbers, were they fairly stated, would appear contemptible, advanced, without a combat, to the foot of the Pyrenean mountains. In the early part of the reign of Honorius, the vigilance of Stilicho had successfully guarded the remote island of Britain from her incessant enemies of the ocean, the mountains, and the Irish coast but those restless barbarians could not neglect the fair opportunity of the Gothic war, when the walls and stations of the province were stripped of the Roman troops. If any of the legionaries were permitted to return from the Italian expedition, their faithful report of the court and character of Honorius must have tended to dissolve the bonds of allegiance, and to exasperate the seditious temper of the British army. The spirit of revolt, which had formerly disturbed the age of Gallienus, was revived by the capricious violence of the soldiers, and the unfortunate, perhaps the ambitious candidates, who were the objects of their choice, were the instruments, and at length the victims, of their passion. Marcus was the first whom they placed on the throne as the lawful emperor of Britain and of the West. They violated, by the hasty murder of Marcus, the oath of fidelity which they had imposed on themselves, and their disapprobation of his manners may seem to inscribe an honourable epitaph on his tomb. 
Gratian was the next whom they adorned with the diadem and the purple, and at the end of four months Gratian experienced the fate of his predecessor. The memory of the great Constantine, whom the British legions had given to the Church and to the Empire, suggested the singular motive of their third choice. They discovered in the ranks a private soldier of the name of Constantine, and their impetuous levity had already seated him on the throne, before they perceived his incapacity to sustain the weight of that glorious appellation. Yet the authority of Constantine was less precarious, and his government was more successful than the transient reigns of Marcus and of Gratian. The danger of leaving his inactive troops in those camps, which had been twice polluted with blood and sedition, urged him to attempt the reduction of the western provinces. He landed at Boulogne with an inconsiderable force, and after he had reposed himself some days, he summoned the cities of Gaul, which had escaped the yoke of the barbarians, to acknowledge their lawful sovereign. They obeyed the summons without reluctance. The neglect of the court of Ravenna had absolved the deserted people from the duty of allegiance. Their actual distress encouraged them to accept any circumstances of change without apprehension, and perhaps with some degree of hope. And they might flatter themselves that the troops, the authority, and even the name of a Roman emperor, who fixed his residence in Gaul, would protect the unhappy country from the rage of the barbarians. The first successes of Constantine against the detached parties of the Germans were magnified by the voice of adulation into splendid and decisive victories, which the reunion and insolence of the enemy soon reduced to their just value. His negotiations procured a short and precarious truce, and if some tribes of the barbarians were engaged, by the liberality of his gifts and promises, to undertake the defence of the Rhine, these expensive and uncertain treaties, instead of restoring the pristine vigour of the Gallic frontier, served only to disgrace the majesty of the prince, and exhaust what yet remained of the treasures of the Republic. Elated, however, with this imaginary triumph, the vain deliverer of Gaul advanced into the provinces of the south, to encounter a more pressing and personal danger. Sarus the Goth was ordered to lay the head of the rebel at the feet of the Emperor Honorius, and the forces of Britain and Italy were unworthily consumed in this domestic quarrel. After the loss of his two bravest generals, Justinian and Nevergastes, the former of whom was slain in the field of battle, the latter in a peaceful but treacherous interview, Constantine fortified himself within the walls of Vienna. The place was ineffectually attacked seven days, and the imperial army supported, in a precipitate retreat, the ignominy of purchasing a secure passage from the freebooters and outlaws of the Alps. Those mountains now separated the dominions of two rival monarchs, and the fortifications of the double frontier were guarded by the troops of the Empire, whose arms would have been more usefully employed to maintain the Roman limits against the barbarians of Germany and Scythia. End of chapter 30, part 4《Chapter Thirty, Part Four of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Three, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Thirty Revolt of the Goths. Part five. On the side of the Pyrenees, the ambition of Constantine might be justified by the proximity of danger, but his throne was soon established by the conquest, or rather submission, of Spain, which yielded to the influence of regular and habitual subordination, and received the laws and magistrates of the Gallic prefecture. The only opposition which was made to the authority of Constantine proceeded not so much from the powers of government 
or the spirit of the people, as from the private zeal and interest of the family of Theodosius. Four brothers had obtained, by the favour of their kinsman, the deceased emperor, an honourable rank and ample possessions in their native country, and the grateful youths resolved to risk those advantages in the service of his son. After an unsuccessful attempt to maintain their ground, at the head of the stationary troops of Lusitania, they retired to their estates, where they armed and levied, at their own expense, a considerable body of slaves and dependents, and boldly marched to occupy the strong posts of the Pyrenean mountains. This domestic insurrection alarmed and perplexed the sovereign of Gaul and Britain, and he was compelled to negotiate with some troops of barbarian auxiliaries for the service of the Spanish war. They were distinguished by the title of Honorians, a name which might have reminded them of their fidelity to their lawful sovereign, and if it should be candidly allowed that the Scots were influenced by any partial affection for a British prince, the Moors and the Marcomanni could be tempted only by the profuse liberality of the usurper, who distributed among the barbarians the military and even the civil honours of Spain. The nine bands of Honorians, which may be easily traced on the establishment of the Western Empire, could not exceed the number of five thousand men, yet this inconsiderable force was sufficient to terminate a war which had threatened the power and safety of Constantine. The rustic army of the Theodosian family was surrounded and destroyed in the Pyrenees. Two of the brothers had the good fortune to escape by sea to Italy, or the east, the other two, after an interval of suspense, were executed at Arles, and if Honorius could remain insensible of the public disgrace, he might perhaps be affected by the personal misfortunes of his generous kinsmen. Such were the feeble arms which decided the possession of the western provinces of Europe, from the wall of Antoninus to the columns of Hercules. The events of peace and war have undoubtedly been diminished by the narrow and imperfect view of the historians of the times, who were equally ignorant of the causes, and of the effects, of the most important revolutions. But the total decay of the national strength had annihilated even the last resource of a despotic government, and the revenue of exhausted provinces could no longer purchase the military service of a discontented and pusillanimous people. The poet whose flattery has ascribed to the Roman eagle the victories of Pallentia and Verona, pursues the hasty retreat of Alaric, from the confines of Italy, with a horrid train of imaginary spectres, such as might hover over an army of barbarians, which was almost exterminated by war, famine, and disease. In the course of this unfortunate expedition, the king of the Goths must indeed have sustained a considerable loss, and his harassed forces required an interval of repose, to recruit their numbers, and revive their confidence. Adversity had exercised, and displayed the genius of Alaric, and the fame of his valour invited to the Gothic standard the bravest of the barbarian warriors, who, from the Euxine to the Rhine, were agitated by the desire of rapine and conquest. He had deserved the esteem, and he soon accepted the friendship of Stilicho himself. Renouncing the service of the Emperor of the East, Alaric concluded, with the court of Ravenna, a treaty of peace and alliance, by which he was declared master-general of the Roman armies throughout the prefecture of Illyricum, as it was claimed, according to the true and ancient limits, by the minister of Honorius. The execution of the ambitious design, which was either stipulated or implied, in the articles of the treaty, appears to have been suspended by the formidable eruption of Radagaisus, and the neutrality of the Gothic king may perhaps be compared to the indifference of Caesar, who, in the conspiracy of Catiline, refused either to assist or to oppose the enemy of the Republic. After the defeat of the Vandals, Stilicho resumed his pretensions to the provinces of the East, appointed civil magistrates for the administration of justice and of the finances, and declared his impatience to lead to the gates of Constantinople the united armies of the Romans and of the Goths. 
The prudence, however, of Stilicho, his aversion to civil war, and his perfect knowledge of the weakness of the state, may countenance the suspicion that domestic peace, rather than foreign conquest, was the object of his policy, and that his principal care was to employ the forces of Alaric at a distance from Italy. This design could not long escape the penetration of the Gothic king, who continued to hold a doubtful and perhaps a treacherous correspondence with the rival courts, who protracted, like a dissatisfied mercenary, his languid operations in Thessaly and Euripus, and who soon returned to claim the extravagant reward of his ineffectual services. From his camp near Emona, on the confines of Italy, he transmitted to the Emperor of the West a long account of promises, of expenses, and of demands, called for immediate satisfaction, and clearly intimated the consequences of a refusal. Yet if his conduct was hostile, his language was decent and dutiful. He humbly professed himself the friend of Stilicho, and the soldier of Honorius, offered his person and his troops to march, without delay, against the usurper of Gaul, and solicited, as a permanent retreat for the Gothic nation, the possession of some vacant province of the Western Empire. The political and secret transactions of two statesmen, who laboured to deceive each other and the world, must for ever have been concealed in the impenetrable darkness of the cabinet, if the debates of a popular assembly had not thrown some rays of light on the correspondence of Alaric and Stilicho. The necessity of finding some artificial support for a government, which, from a principle not of moderation, but of weakness, was reduced to negotiate with its own subjects, had insensibly revived the authority of the Roman Senate, and the minister of Honorius respectfully consulted the legislative council of the Republic. Stilicho assembled the Senate in the palace of the Caesars, represented in a studied oration the actual state of affairs, proposed the demands of the Gothic king, and submitted to their consideration the choice of peace or war. The senators, as if they had been suddenly awakened from a dream of four hundred years, appeared, on this important occasion, to be inspired by the courage, rather than by the wisdom, of their predecessors. They loudly declared, in regular speeches, or in tumultuary acclamations, that it was unworthy of the majesty of Rome to purchase a precarious and disgraceful truce from a barbarian king, and that, in the judgment of a magnanimous people, the chance of ruin was always preferable to the certainty of dishonour. The minister, whose pacific intentions were seconded only by the voice of a few servile and venal followers, attempted to allay the general ferment, by an apology for his own conduct, and even for the demands of the Gothic prince. The payment of a subsidy, which had excited the indignation of the Romans, ought not, such was the language of Stilicho, to be considered in the odious light, either of a tribute, or of a ransom, extorted by the menaces of a barbarian army. Alaric had faithfully asserted the just pretensions of the Republic to the provinces which were usurped by the Greeks of Constantinople. He modestly required the fair and stipulated recompense of his services, and, if he had desisted from the prosecution of his enterprise, he had obeyed, in his retreat, the peremptory, though private, letters of the Emperor himself. These contradictory orders, he would not dissemble the errors of his own family, had been procured by the intercession of Serena. The tender piety of his wife had been too deeply affected by the discord of the royal brothers, the sons of her adopted father, and the sentiments of nature had too easily prevailed over the stern dictates of the public welfare. These ostensible reasons, which faintly disguise the obscure intrigues of the palace of Ravenna, were supported by the authority of Stilicho, and obtained, after a warm debate, the reluctant approbation of the Senate. The tumult of virtue and freedom subsided, and the sum of four thousand pounds of gold was granted, under the name of a subsidy, to secure the peace of Italy, and to conciliate the friendship of the King of the Goths. Lampadius alone, one of the most illustrious members of the assembly, 
still persisted in his dissent, exclaimed with a loud voice, This is not a treaty of peace, but of servitude, and escaped the danger of such bold opposition by immediately retiring to the sanctuary of a Christian church. But the reign of Stilicho drew towards its end, and the proud minister might perceive the symptoms of his approaching disgrace. The generous boldness of Lampadius had been applauded, and the Senate, so patiently resigned to a long servitude, rejected with disdain the offer of invidious and imaginary freedom. The troops, who still assumed the name and prerogatives of the Roman legions, were exasperated by the partial affection of Stilicho for the barbarians, and the people imputed to the mischievous policy of the minister the public misfortunes which were the natural consequence of their own degeneracy. Yet Stilicho might have continued to brave the clamours of the people, and even of the soldiers, if he could have maintained his dominion over the feeble mind of his pupil. But the respectful attachment of Honorius was converted into fear, suspicion, and hatred. The crafty Olympius, who concealed his vices under the mask of Christian piety, had secretly undermined the benefactor, by whose favour he was promoted to the honourable offices of the imperial palace. Olympius revealed to the unsuspecting emperor, who had attained the twenty-fifth year of his age, that he was without weight or authority in his own government, and artfully alarmed his timid and indolent disposition by a lively picture of the designs of Stilicho, who already meditated the death of his sovereign with the ambitious hope of placing the diadem on the head of his son Eucherius. The emperor was instigated, by his new favourite, to assume the tone of independent dignity, and the minister was astonished to find that secret resolutions were formed in the court and council, which were repugnant to his interest or to his intentions. Instead of residing in the palace of Rome, Honorius declared that it was his pleasure to return to the secure fortress of Ravenna. On the first intelligence of the death of his brother Arcadius, he prepared to visit Constantinople, and to regulate, with the authority of a guardian, the provinces of the infant Theodosius. The representation of the difficulty and expense of such a distant expedition checked this strange and sudden sally of active diligence but the dangerous project of showing the emperor to the camp of Pavia, which was composed of the Roman troops, the enemies of Stilicho, and his barbarian auxiliaries, remained fixed and unalterable. The minister was pressed, by the advice of his confidant, Justinian, a Roman advocate, of a lively and penetrating genius, to oppose a journey so prejudicial to his reputation and safety. His strenuous but ineffectual efforts confirmed the triumph of Olympius, and the prudent lawyer withdrew himself from the impending ruin of his patron. In the passage of the emperor through Bologna, a mutiny of the guards was excited and appeased by the secret policy of Stilicho, who announced his instructions to decimate the guilty, and ascribed to his own intercession the merit of their pardon. After this tumult, Honorius embraced, for the last time, the minister whom he now considered as a tyrant, and proceeded on his way to the camp of Pavia, where he was received by the loyal acclamations of the troops who were assembled for the service of the Gallic War. On the morning of the fourth day he pronounced, as he had been taught, a military oration in the presence of the soldiers, whom the charitable visits and artful discourses of Olympus had prepared to execute a dark and bloody conspiracy. At the first signal they massacred the friends of Stilicho, the most illustrious officers of the empire, two praetorian prefects, of Gaul and of Italy, two masters-general of the cavalry and infantry, the master of the offices, the questor, the treasurer, and the count of the domestics. Many lives were lost, many houses were plundered, the furious sedition continued to rage until the close of the evening, and the trembling emperor, who was seen in the streets of Pavia without his robes or diadem, yielded to the persuasions of his favourite, condemned the memory of the slain, 
and solemnly approved the innocence and fidelity of their assassins. The intelligence of the massacre of Pavia filled the mind of Stilicho with just and gloomy apprehensions, and he instantly summoned, in the camp of Bologna, a council of the confederate leaders who were attached to his service, and would be involved in his ruin. The impetuous voice of the assembly called aloud for arms, and for revenge, to march without a moment's delay under the banners of a hero whom they had so often followed to victory, to surprise, to oppress, to extirpate the guilty Olympius and his degenerate Romans, and perhaps to fix the diadem on the head of their injured general. Instead of executing a resolution which might have been justified by success, Stilicho hesitated till he was irrevocably lost. He was still ignorant of the fate of the Emperor, he distrusted the fidelity of his own party, and he viewed with horror the fatal consequences of arming a crowd of licentious barbarians against the soldiers and people of Italy. The confederates, impatient of his timorous and doubtful delay, hastily retired with fear and indignation. At the hour of midnight, Sarus, a Gothic warrior, renowned among the barbarians themselves for his strength and valour, suddenly invaded the camp of his benefactor, plundered the baggage, cut in pieces the faithful Huns who guarded his person, and penetrated to the tent where the minister, pensive and sleepless, meditated on the dangers of his situation. Stilicho escaped with difficulty from the sword of the Goths, and, after issuing a last and generous admonition to the cities of Italy, to shut their gates against the barbarians, his confidence, or his despair, urged him to throw himself into Ravenna, which was already in the absolute possession of his enemies. Olympius, who had assumed the dominion of Honorius, was speedily informed that his rival had embraced, as a suppliant, the altar of the Christian church. The base and cruel disposition of the hypocrite was incapable of pity or remorse but he piously affected to elude, rather than to violate, the privilege of the sanctuary. Count Heracleon, with a troop of soldiers, appeared at the dawn of day, before the gates of the church of Ravenna. The bishop was satisfied by a solemn oath that the imperial mandate only directed them to secure the person of Stilicho, but as soon as the unfortunate minister had been tempted beyond the holy threshold, he produced the warrant for his instant execution. Stilicho supported, with calm resignation, the injurious names of traitor and parricide, repressed the unseasonable zeal of his followers, who were ready to attempt an ineffectual rescue, and with a firmness not unworthy of the last of the Roman generals, submitted his neck to the sword of Heraclean. The servile crowd of the palace, who had so long adored the fortune of Stilicho, affected to insult his fall and the most distant connection with the Master-General of the West, which had so lately been a title to wealth and honours, was studiously denied and rigorously punished. His family, united by a triple alliance with the family of Theodosius, might envy the condition of the meanest peasant. The flight of his son Eucherius was intercepted, and the death of that innocent youth soon followed the divorce of Thermantia, who filled the place of her sister Maria, and, who like Maria, had remained a virgin in the imperial bed. The friends of Stilicho, who had escaped the massacre of Pavia, were persecuted by the implacable revenge of Olympius, and the most exquisite cruelty was employed to extort the confession of a treasonable and sacrilegious conspiracy. They died in silence, their firmness justified the choice, and perhaps absolved the innocence of their patron and the despotic power, which could take his life without a trial, and stigmatize his memory without a proof, has no jurisdiction over the impartial suffrage of posterity. The services of Stilicho are great and manifest. His crimes, as they are vaguely stated in the language of flattery and hatred, are obscure at least, and improbable. About four months after his death an edict was published, in the name of Honorius, to restore the free communication of the two empires, which had been so long interrupted by the public enemy. 
the minister, whose fame and fortune depended on the prosperity of the state, was accused of betraying Italy to the barbarians, whom he repeatedly vanquished at Palentia, at Verona, and before the walls of Florence. His pretended design of placing the diadem on the head of his son Eucherius could not have been conducted without preparations or accomplices, and the ambitious father would not surely have left the future emperor, till the twentieth year of his age, in the humble station of tribune of the notaries. Even the religion of Stilicho was arraigned by the malice of his rival. The seasonable and almost miraculous deliverance was devoutly celebrated by the applause of the clergy, who asserted that the restoration of idols and the persecution of the church would have been the first measure of the reign of Eucherius. The son of Stilicho, however, was educated in the bosom of Christianity, which his father had uniformly professed and zealously supported. Serena had borrowed her magnificent necklace from the statue of Vesta, and the pagans execrated the memory of the sacrilegious minister, by whose order the Sibylline books, the oracles of Rome, had been committed to the flames. The pride and power of Stilicho constituted his real guilt. An honourable reluctance to shed the blood of his countrymen appears to have contributed to the success of his unworthy rival, and it is the last humiliation of the character of Honorius that posterity has not condescended to reproach him with his base ingratitude to the guardian of his youth and the support of his empire. Among the train of dependents, whose wealth and dignity attracted the notice of their own times, our curiosity is excited by the celebrated name of the poet Claudian, who enjoyed the favour of Stilicho, and was overwhelmed in the ruin of his patron. The titular offices of tribune and notary fixed his rank in the imperial court. He was indebted to the powerful intercession of Serena for his marriage with a very rich heiress of the province of Africa, and the statue of Claudian, erected in the Forum of Trajan, was a monument to the taste and liberality of the Roman Senate. After the praises of Stilicho became offensive and criminal, Claudian was exposed to the enmity of a powerful and unforgiving courtier, whom he had provoked by the insolence of wit. He had compared, in a lively epigram, the opposite characters of two Praetorian prefects of Italy. He contrasts the innocent repose of a philosopher, who sometimes resigned the hours of business to slumber, perhaps to study, with the interesting diligence of a rapacious minister, indefatigable in the pursuit of unjust or sacrilegious gain. How happy, continues Claudian, how happy might it be for the people of Italy, if Malleus could be constantly awake, and if Hadrian would always sleep. The repose of Malleus was not disturbed by this friendly and gentle admonition but the cruel vigilance of Hadrian watched the opportunity of revenge, and easily obtained, from the enemies of Stilicho, the trifling sacrifice of an obnoxious poet. The poet concealed himself, however, during the tumult of the revolution, and consulting the dictates of prudence rather than of honour, he addressed, in the form of an epistle, a suppliant and humble recantation to the offended prefect. He deplores in mournful strains the fatal indiscretion into which he had been hurried by passion and folly, submits to the imitation of his adversary, the generous examples of the clemency of gods, of heroes, and of lions, and expresses his hope that the magnanimity of Hadrian will not trample on a defenceless and contemptible foe, already humbled by disgrace and poverty, and deeply wounded by the exile, the tortures, and the death of his dearest friends whatever might be the success of his prayer, or the accidents of his future life, the period of a few years levelled in the grave the minister and the poet. But the name of Hadrian is almost sunk in oblivion, while Claudian is read with pleasure in every country which has retained, or acquired, the knowledge of the Latin language. If we fairly balance his merits and his defects, we shall acknowledge that Claudian does not either satisfy or silence our reason. It would not be easy to produce a passage that deserves the epithet of sublime or pathetic, to select a verse that melts the heart or enlarges the imagination. We should vainly seek, in the poems of Claudian, 
the happy invention and artificial conduct of an interesting fable, or the just and lively representation of the characters and situations of real life. For the service of his patron, he published occasional panegyrics and invectives, and the design of these slavish compositions encouraged his propensity to exceed the limits of truth and nature. These imperfections, however, are compensated in some degree by the poetical virtues of Claudian. He was endowed with the rare and precious talent of raising the meanest, of adorning the most barren, and of diversifying the most similar topics. His colouring, more especially in descriptive poetry, is soft and splendid, and he seldom fails to display, and even to abuse, the advantages of a cultivated understanding, a copious fancy, an easy and sometimes forcible expression, and a perpetual flow of harmonious versification. To these commendations, independent of any accidents of time and place, we must add the peculiar merit which Claudian derived from the unfavourable circumstances of his birth. In the decline of arts and of empire, a native of Egypt, who had received the education of a Greek, assumed, in a mature age, the familiar use and absolute command of the Latin language, soared above the heads of his feeble contemporaries, and placed himself, after an interval of three hundred years, among the poets of ancient Rome. End of chapter 30, part 5